Welcome to the Futurist Society podcast, where we delve into the latest advancements in technology, science, and culture. From discussions on the latest breakthroughs in AI, biotechnology, and space exploration, the Futurist Society is your window into all the awesomeness that the future holds. Get ready to be informed and inspired as we consider the positive impact of emerging technologies on humanity. Without further ado, welcome your host, Dr. Awesome. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Futurist Society. As always, we have a really interesting guest. And as always, we are going to be talking in the present, but talking about the future. So today we have Maggie Grayson, who is really cool. She's a futurist. She's a designer. And she's talking to a lot of people about what they think about the future as well in regards to her own company. She's doing a lot of things with museums and giving a lot of insights there. So I'd love to talk with her a little bit more. So it's the CEO of The Future Is Present. That's your company. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing in this space, Maggie. Thank you. Uh, it's so great to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. What I what I can tell you is that I'm a futurist that specializes in process. And so the work that I do is helping individuals and organizations to think about the future so that they can make better decisions today. There's lots of different ways of doing that. And the practice that I come from is it's a design design space. So I have a master's degree in strategic foresight and innovation. And this is an interesting practice that started in North America and Europe, very northern, northern hemisphere thinking that started after World War II. And the idea was we must think the unthinkable. And that was a military strategist named Herman Kahn who invented that, that phrase. So the practice for many decades has been, how can we win in the face of extreme uncertainty? And the methods have been about reducing uncertainty, becoming, I guess, more comfortable with it in a way that organizations can operate. In the last 10 years, it shifted to be more about how might individuals operate and, and feel comfortable about the future and make decisions for the future. Eco-anxiety is a huge, huge, huge problem now. It's emerging and... So this question about how might we contribute in a future that's unknown as individuals is something that I'm working on and, and working with museums is a place that really gets close to my heart. So I'm not familiar with that term ego anxiety. What do you mean by that? Oh, eco anxiety. Oh, eco anxiety. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I totally feel that. I mean, that's something that I, everybody is thinking about, which is the downstream effects of climate change. And is that what you're, you're highlighting there? Absolutely. I feel yeah. like that's the number one pessimism for the future that, and I feel like a strong number two is artificial intelligence. That's going to be wiping at our jobs, <laughs> wiping out our species. Who knows what's going to happen with that? But I, I personally, I feel a lot more optimistic about it, you know, and it's nice to talk to people like you, like if you have a strategy in place, and that strategy has shown you some benefit, I think it becomes much more optimistic. Like if you were a basketball team and you're playing another basketball team, you don't have the opportunity to know what their playbook is. But if you have a really good strategy and you're winning, like that makes you feel good. And if it continues to win over other basketball teams, like repeatedly, then that would make you feel amazing. And I feel like that's something that is available to us, but people really don't know about the process. So can you explain that process a little bit? Sure. So the the process is using multiple tools, multiple frameworks, uh, deep research. And what we're looking at is when we talk about strategic foresight or futuring, it's more than just three or five years into the future. But those tend to be strategic plans and they can come out as an end result that's very productive of the work that we do. But originally, we look far into the future to generate possibilities that are quite extreme. So I use this example about Toronto quite frequently because it's very easy to understand. So in 30 years, let's say, what if Toronto was underwater? 
-hmm. We take this extreme characteristic and what might a city of, you know, at that point, maybe it's three and a half, four million people be when it's underwater and the emergency services will say, oh yeah, we've got this, this, and this covered for the first day or the first week or the first month. But when you look at that over time, what are some of the unexpected um, implications that might might affect people, might affect animals, might affect energy and so on? Mm -hmm. So the work that I do is taking a characteristic potential threat or potential future and asking questions that challenge existing strategy and existing what we think we know. Mm -hmm. And I don't do that just with one scenario. I do that with multiple scenarios. So for example, what if Toronto was purchased by New York state? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what does that look like for the dollar? What does that look like for jobs? What does that look like for education? You know, uh, how, do you say, how, how do you do that with museums? Cause I know that that's something that we had talked about earlier. Cause I, when I think about a museum, I think about looking backwards and a chronological history of what has already happened when you're looking forwards i mean maybe like you know if you're talking about like a science museum or something like that i could see something that is applicable but but how do you how do you fit into that ecosystem mm -hmm. that's a great question so i'll kind of wrap the bow around the process which is helping to to look at multiple extreme scenarios I'll ask a museum, how do you think you might contribute in a scenario that you can't control or unexpect? And they they will detail out specific scenarios based on research, like this is happening right now in another country or in another sector. And how might we respond to that? The the COVID, as an example, was a fantastic. I guess, learning experience for museums, asking questions like what is relevant and how might we be resilient in a place of complete upheaval? So when I work with museums, I ask, what's it like in 2050? What do you think? What are your assumptions? And what are your biases about that? And let's work from those, those as facts and then add some more details. So Let's look at major major drivers of change like AI, climate change, trust, shifting populations because of climate refugees. And does that change your visitors? Does that change what they want to know? Does that change who your staff has to be in order to still address the mandate of, of education, making it education accessible? Um, and then how, that, how, how do you how do you factor in that kind of strategy for maybe not like a museum but for a business and I, i'm asking really for just personal benefit like you know i run a small business we we employ about 150 people and we're trying to like figure out what the trade winds are what like the you know what is 10 years going to look like for us is there any benefit to this process for someone like me for sure, for sure, absolutely. The, the one of the companies that I worked for was a textile computing company, and it was run by an engineer. And they were thinking twenty years into the future. And for them, it was everybody, all the time, everywhere will be wearing textiles that grab data off of our body, and we'll use it for input, output, I uh, love that, and and communication. Right. So yeah. you've this this incredible platform interface that doesn't have mm -hmm. a screen but it's a information highway absolutely yeah the amount of sensor availability if you were able to harness the power of clothes like the amount of information that you would be able just like from a health perspective you know that's where my background is that would be pretty interesting so anyway sorry go ahead i didn't mean to cut you off how did this company use the idea of futuristic thinking the idea of the what you're detailing how did they use it to get ahead well, what, what we did was with this aspirational scenario of everybody everywhere all the time being able to use that, it's, we know that that can't ever be true. 
So we looked at the extreme side, which is who might this need to be true for? And also looked at personal stories. So anybody who worked in the company would say, I'm working on this to their cousin or at a party. And the answers would be, wow, I wish my sister had that because her knee X, or I wish my daughter had this because she wants to talk to her grandmother and they can't communicate, whatever. So the edge cases become interesting to any company. And then you kind of look at what are some of the edge cases happening that you don't know about. So what ended up happening was we created scenarios of future personas that were in no longer in extreme scenarios. So let's have my granddaughter and my grandmother talking to each other. What is a way that an elderly person can talk to a self-driving car? So we look at trends that are outside of fashion and textiles and bodies communicating with each other to what are some of the that might impact and intersect how people behave at a potential level for innovation. So mm -hmm. me medical is an amazing example because mm -hmm. they're, you're so connected to labs. You're so connected to industries and data. And yeah. so I'll give you an example of working with a food bank mm -hmm. to 2050 and said, what's it going to be like for everyone here to be no longer food insecure? Mm -hmm. And we, we looked at who are the climate change refugees might be. And then, you know, down the line, there was a whole bunch of other research, but down the line, how might they make decisions today to make the food bank a better robust place? So one of the, as a provider for service, one of the things that came out of this conversation was we need advocacy in the government. So again, in, in your instance, what are some of the support systems that are not necessarily core to your business, but who are partners that you might need that you haven't thought about right now? Mm -hmm. Or like, what like, can you ready? give me examples of that? I'm just not sure. Yeah. Um, following. Sure, sure. So to connect to the, the food bank as an example, if people have more data about themselves mm -hmm. and personalized medicine of growing interest to everyone on mm -hmm. some level mm -hmm. in 30 years from now, how might somebody walk into a food bank and say, I have this allergy, this particular medical situation. I'm neurodivergent. I also have parents who have a history of cancer. So all of the data that somebody brings in to a food bank and staff in the food bank say, okay, we have, we have chia seeds instead of cans of peanut butter for you, mm. you know, interesting, a tailored diet based on the data that you're already have access to. That's an interesting future. Are you optimistic about the future? I'm a very optimistic person. Yeah. Uh, I have to be. Am I optimistic about the future? Yes, because I see changes happening in in how people understand themselves. And I see people advocating for self-knowledge, agency, new skills such as empathy, futures thinking, mm -hmm. collaboration, project management, and the difference between 20th century skills and 21st century skills, so dramatic yeah. that there's institutions and providers that are starting to not only talk about it, but serve to mm -hmm. 21st century skills. What would That's you, like, what, I've never thought about it like that. Like, what would you say is a 21st century skill in comparison to a 20th century skill? Good question. <laughs> All of your questions are great. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just curious, like, cause I don't get to meet a lot of futurists like that, that are just thinking about the future. A lot of the people that I, that I talk to are building the future, right? Like they're, they're doing something very cutting edge, like, you know, artificial intelligence or genetics or something like that, that I'm personally interested in, but it's nice to talk to somebody that like, is just thinking about this stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. What do you like? What's the difference? Like, cause I, I mean, I think that all of our listeners would want to 
focus on their 21st century skills, but they might not know what that is. Well, so here's a question for you. I'm going to try this example, but sure. I'm, I'm a practitioner. I'm not, I'm not yeah. built future. Yeah, yeah. Here's a question. When you went to school, mm-hmm. what are some of the, the hard skills that you learned? Yeah, that's a, I see where you're going with this. So surgical recall, right? Like the ability to understand an anatomic landmark as opposed to, you know, just something that's there, right? Like if I'm looking at an artery, I know that this is the maxillary artery and not just like some feeder artery. Based on the uh, layers of the face that I've cut through, you know? So I see where like the thought exercise is going with this. And like, I see how that could be irrelevant in the future. You know, like if I'm wearing a Google glass that shows me exactly where that is like a heads up display like you see in science fiction shows which they like points out things to you like i could see how that would be less relevant but also like just calculations was a big thing too like i need to be able to make quick calculations on the fly and i could see how that could be irrelevant as well because you know if i'm administering a medication and it's dose by weight i need to be able to quickly make that dose on the fly and theoretically like an artificial intelligence could just give me the appropriate dose right based on all the data that's collected so i see the way you're going with that but yeah i mean surgical recall would be important data calculation empathy is definitely an important skill that we were taught in in my training and i feel like that's not going out of style like when i think of 21st century skills I think the human aspect is going to be much more like the things that humans can do that AI or computers are not good at, like empathy, touchy feely kind of stuff. That stuff is going to be more important. Is is that correct? in my thinking? Yeah, that's a great example. I strongly, I'm very optimistic about humans Mm -hmm. and that AI will be a tool or a partner or in manufacturing, we call them cobots, Mm -hmm. a coworker and a robot together that the things that make us human will be emphasized in our work. And, you know, if you look at from the printing press, which is, we're just going to put words on a page that are, it's information that we want to tell people using the printing press. There's lots of mechanical properties to it. But now if we look at social media and the platforms of the world, the stories and the words that go into that have a much more nuanced and complicated relationship to the people who are reading. And we go from a blank understanding of information being told to you. And to bring Mm -hmm. this back to museums, these are the collections that we got. I went and I stole or I shot or I, you know, whatever. This is my stuff. I want you to see it. To, you know, go back to social media as an example. These are current issues and current problems that we're dealing with. And we're going to make this where you can explore how you think about these problems. And a 21st century skill from that might be collaboration. It might be critical thinking. It could be collaborating with people who think completely different than you and Mm -hmm. understanding the languages aren't the same. I have no idea what you just said to me. And Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. I have a, you know, design for theater background. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when you're saying those things, I'm interpreting them visually and they're going to be wrong because I've never cut someone's face open. Mm-hmm. However, if I asked you to think about translating a blank document or not a blank document, but like a eight and a half by 11 piece of paper mm-hmm. into a living experience that could be hard for some people, maybe not you, but other people that you have trained with. Mm -hmm. And so the two of us, me and this, you know, hypothetical situation would have to come together to look at what are the values? What's the story that we're trying to tell? Who is involved in the story and who's allowed to be a part of it? And who's not there? And why are they not there? Mm -hmm. I know you're writing a book right now and you're interviewing like a bunch of different people, their thoughts on the future. What is just the kind of common threads that you see with all the interviews that you're doing? Because I know you're talking to people who have 
huge budgets and you know non-traditional things like museums and stuff like that but tell me some common threads that you're noticing that regardless of the background they feel the same way about the future yeah thanks for asking that question my my book is called making futures present and it's a field guide for future thinking mavericks and next level decision making in times of extreme uncertainty so I've interviewed people who have PhDs in fire studies. I've interviewed museum directors from Colombia, Medellin, Colombia. I've interviewed people who are managing global affairs for uh, the national, you know, for Canada. And what they say by and large isn't, I'm worried about the process in which I choose to make decisions. What I'm afraid of is making the wrong decision and the wrong decision often involves hurting people. So yeah. I don't want to hurt people. My process is to survey the landscape and ask for a lot of opinions. Or my process is to go with my gut. And I have a lot of experience. And I know that the right decision is going to be based on all of the things that I've gone through before. And I'm making a decision with the best thing that I can do, yeah. right. How do you how do you push back against that? Because it sounds like you're advocating for a process that is not your gut, right? I also make that gut type of decision making. And I don't always necessarily feel like it's like the best way. It's just, you know, it it's the best way that I know how because I'm thinking in my head, the best predictor of future performance is past performance. And in this subsection of data that I have in my own life experience. This is how I think that the future performance is going to look like. But is there something that you're teaching these people that is a better way? Thanks for asking. I, I come from a place where looking at how a person thinks and feels about the future is key as a as data points, what their assumptions are, what their bias are, because everyone has bias. Mm -hmm. And I and I help them to identify that they do have a perspective that doesn't look around the whole horizon at all of the factors that are coming. Also, what are some of the filters that they have right now that they can't see what the factors are today? So one of the things that when we think about the future, we tend to think of it as menacing. Mm -hmm. So some of the decisions that we make may be um, because we don't want something to happen. So we're, we're making decisions to protect ourselves as opposed to making decisions toward an optimistic future or an idea of abundance. Mm -hmm. versus a utopia, a utopia versus a dystopia. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So one of the problems is that when we think of the future as menacing, and there's all sorts of reasons why thinking about the future as scary and, and you know, I guess unwanted, mm -hmm. is the news is talking about things that are bad all the time. Right? Yeah, right. Like bloody headlines is yeah. very important. But I mean, you know, certainly it seems like that is the most important thing, like you said, that all these people that you're talking to, the number one thing that they worry about that they're trying to make a plan for right now to predict the future is that they don't want to hurt people, which honestly is it, it, it just when you said that it made me have faith in humanity, <laughs> you know, like it's not like for personal gain. They just like if they're creating a new technology, they don't want to hurt people, which is awesome. But on the same token, how are they how are they assuring that to happen? You know, because I wonder if all of the focus from the news and, and you know, like are they using these worst case scenarios to avoid them or does it cloud their judgment thinking like that's going to be the most likely scenario? Like how's the process unfolding for people that want to avoid harm? Yeah. So I will talk a little bit about the process. It, it can get a little bit jargony. So if I go over jargony, please. Sure. Yeah. I'll ask just like right I did on the play. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> so the, some of the processes that we use, again, frameworks and tools and so on, are in a facilitated scenario. One of the things that is very common in thinking strategic planning, but strategic foresight, which is farther into the future, is how does this 
problem that we're thinking about, how is it going to impact science or society, technology, economy, environment, politics, and values? And so that's one of the frames. There's lots of different other frames or frameworks that we can ask this question of, and whether it's how does science impact medicine? How does values impact medicine? And what are some of the, the major changes that we see now or small examples? So that's a framework for starting to unearth questions, assumptions, and, and data. Another framework that we use is called Three Horizons. And we'll start in the future and say, this is the ideal future that we want. In, in 2050, nobody has, no one is food insecure. Hmm. That's the goal. And then you track backwards. So what do we need to do five years before that? Mm -hmm. What do we need to do five years before that until you get to the present and are at a place of decision-making to try to rein in some of the effort that you do so that it's all pointing towards an optimistic outcome or the best outcome that you you want. Mm -hmm. And there's one of the ones, another one that's very popular is creating multiple scenarios. Mm -hmm. And in strategic planning, sometimes they'll call it the North Star. Mm -hmm. Whereas I use futures multiple as a tool. So instead of looking at this is the future that we want and where we're going. These are our projections. These are, mm -hmm. this is the strategic plan from today. Mm -hmm. We look at different types of futures that are strongly characterized. Mm -hmm. And for example, what if none of the states have access to water, mm -hmm. which is an extreme example However, if you look at particular cities in the U.S., what is happening because they don't have access to water? Mm. Where are people moving from and to because they don't have access to water anymore or clean mm -hmm. water, mm -hmm. any water in some cases? What are some other extreme examples? What if uh, China purchased all of the U.S.? And so how the politics and the logistics change because of that, mm -hmm. like I can go on and on. Who is that? Yeah. Who's asking these? That, that seems like a really extreme case. Like who's asking that question? You know, that just my own personal curiosity, because I feel like that's mental energy otherwise wasted personally. I, I feel like there's so many things that you brought up that I want to know how we fix food insecurity. Like I want to know how we fix or how do we get ourselves out of the climate change issue? You know, uh, like, uh, specifically that example, like, are people asking that question? I, I feel like that's just like so unlikely, you know? The, unfortunately, the answer is it depends for okay. any question that you want to ask about yeah. the future. Right. We, we don't know what the future is. And yeah. I will live and die by that statement. Of yeah, me. yeah. No, I know we don't know what the future is, but I'm always trying to figure out a better way to navigate the future, you know? Because right now, honestly, I just feel like there's so much change happening so rapidly that it's sometimes e very easy to get overwhelmed. And I, I like the North Star philosophy that you brought up because, you know, I, I think that that's something that at least makes me feel more comfortable in the face of ever-present change. Like, for example, AI, right? Yeah, I mean, I could look at this thing and it could be an existential threat or I could look at it in the guise of you know star trek which is like a utopia and i would love to have a robot best friend you know like like commander data where i'm seeing him navigate the world as a robot and he's seeing me navigate the world as a human like that sounds like a really fun future you know so i look at that and i'm like man it would be so awesome if we have that and so i don't want to discount all of the benefits of artificial intelligence because it's, you know, this extreme negative. I, I try to look at the positive. So that's one thing I really like about the North Star idea that you bring, bring up. But also I think that, at least for me, like in my own life, I look at it like, yeah, there's a lot of potential futures, but each one has an overwhelming probability 
of it happening or not happening. And I try not to get bogged down with the stuff that's just not going to happen. You know, I, because it's so easy to go down a rabbit hole. And I feel like that's a lot of what the con contributions from the negative aspects of journalism that you're talking about. It's just like, it's so easy to get caught up in like this, like potential worst case scenario, which may or may not come to pass and most likely will not come to pass, you know? So that's really what the, the reason that I was asking those questions, because I'm sure that people are out there and they're trying to figure out how do I make sense of all this change? Because it's so easy as a human being to be afraid of what you don't know. Right. And so that's that's just me for my own personal benefit, trying to figure out what does a futurist like yourself that's not only devoted themselves to this process, but also has seen a lot of and talked with a lot of other people that have undergone this process, what are, what kind of strategies are they using to navigate all this stuff? There's, you asked a lot of questions. Yeah, and... I know. Sorry. <laughs> Just... I don't know if like, oh, I really yeah. want to address that. Yeah, no, I, I apologize. I tend to do that. It's no, it's, it's, I think it's how you make all your guests look so smart because <laughs> here's 10 questions. If you could just, you know, send me an essay, that'd be great. Anyway, sure. No. I, well, I can send you a WhatsApp with about. No, no, that's all right. Just go <laughs> ahead. Go, tell me what you thought of that really long okay. rant. So there's, there's a couple of things. I started talking about the North Star and yeah. the North Star isn't necessarily the destination. It is an aspirational or an optimistic or a best case scenario destiny, yeah. right? It's yeah. the preferred future. And some of the crazy scenarios that I was introducing are specific to, I'll say the client's situation. So I'm not going to overwhelm you with, you know, what happens if um, all of the bees are gone forever. You know, that, that might be pretty, pretty excruciating to think about especially when you're trying to make a decision. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is I'll tailor some of those specific and extreme questions to the situation, to the, the client's key question mm -hmm. about what might healthcare be like or, or dental health be like for people who are 100 plus mm -hmm. in 2050. Mm-hmm. And that's a, perhaps not a lot of people are asking that question, but there's some real tensions in it mm -hmm. that you have to think about people of a certain age, what particular medical problems they might have, what might be influencing that, that help or hinder progress. The, to go down a little bit downstream, you were talking about trends that are going away and like, sorry, getting away from us. Not all trends go in a distinct increasing direction. So the British call it the moment, right? Like, like Doc Martens are having their moment. Oh yeah. So right. things, things come and go and they change mm -hmm. at different rates. Mm -hmm. the, the question, trends, trends, right? That's what trends. you're talking Yeah. The fads. Trends come and go. Yeah. yeah. I've caught up, I've been caught up in a lot of trends and fads as a, as somebody who's interested in the future. I really thought that the Windows phone was going to be the next revolutionary, <laughs> but that just didn't happen. That was like my best friend always comments on that. Like every time I think that I'm good at predicting the future, he's like, remember when you thought that the Windows phone was <laughs> going to be the next big thing? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's, I also feel like that about this. I thought about that, about the Cybertruck. I was like, this is going to be so revolutionary. <laughs> Never really panned out. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. It just, I thought that was funny. No, these are these are fantastic examples and and they're real examples. Mm -hmm. And when when you think of what's happening in the lab or what people are talking about in mainstream media, these are having their moment and they may or may not come to fruition. They may or may not be something that affects everybody everywhere all the time, like the internet. They're they're calling the future of the internet the splinternet, where yeah. Some people have access to social media platforms in certain countries because they pay more for yeah. it. What does that do for equality for people who can't access Facebook, as an example, because they can't afford the data plan? That's happening right now. Yeah. So the process involved is looking for specific signals that may or may not change things in the future. Mm -hmm. And a a cluster of signals that are relevant mm -hmm. 
may become a trend. We'll do an impact analysis of what if that trend becomes a major driver of change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a, an example that is related to coin and, and crypto and things like that. There's a lot of pushback from financial institutions mm -hmm. that do not want to see ulterior method, oh, alternate methods of payment that they can't track or mm -hmm. change or have control mm -hmm. over. So what if that does become a predominant way of value exchange for monies? Mm -hmm. Might illegal transactions happen in cash? Mm -hmm. As opposed to you know, what, what legislation is trying to do is prevent illegal transactions happening in the digital space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what if that And some countries are moving towards crypto, um, yeah. blockchain technologies, because their their inflation is yeah. running. Yeah, I I think crypto is something that I still have not wrapped my head around. You know, so much of my I think optimism comes from science fiction, and you know, in every utopian society, every single one that at least that I've been reading about that's not true not every single one but a, a lot of the utopian societies money is not a thing anymore right and the whole idea of wealth and you know keeping up with the joneses is not a thing right and so that's something that i don't know how do we get to that promised land to that north star you know but i i wonder from you because we are getting close to the end of our time and do you read science fiction at all is that something that you're interested in or not really I, I read a little bit of everything. Um, or do you, do you follow like science? I, I don't know. What, what The reason why I'm, I'm asking that question is like, what is your utopian vision, right? Like when you like, think about like, your North Star, you know, uh, for me, I'm, I'm just being honest with you. It's Star Trek because I look at that and of all of the utopian societies, I feel like that's the best one. That's the one that I want to live in the most, you know? And I was just wondering as a futurist yourself, what, what do you think your North Star is going to look like? My North Star is access to food, fresh mm -hmm. food, and access to clean water, mm -hmm. free, great conversations like this yeah. one, and being able to be in touch with friends and family and giving back in mm -hmm. a way that feels satisfying and permanent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, being in Canada, you probably have a lot of those things already right now. So your 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 utopia is available to you. And I think what you mean by that is that you want it to be available to everyone, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the goal, obviously. The the idea of an equitable distribution of future benefit is that's like a really tough concept to wrap your head around, you know, because like I want the progress. I want a robot butler, but like realistically, it's going to be a while before Africa gets robot butlers, right? It's something that it's, I don't want to end on that. That's like a pessimistic thing. Tell me what you're optimistic about. You know, <laughs> I think there's so many things to be optimistic about. Like, for example, food security is one of the things that you highlighted. Like, how do we get there? Like, how, how do people feel better about their food security? Like, what do you think is coming down the pipeline that they should be excited about? Okay. I, well, let's take this back to museums for a second, because that's a sure. something that I know. The way that museums are changing is, first, what I love about them is the informal education opportunities that they provide, mm -hmm. and the way people can connect to information in, in new ways. That's one of the ways that things are changing. So from a look at my stuff to mm -hmm. how do you want to participate in the future. And I think that education, intersectionality, relevancy, who works in museums, who gets to tell their stories, how they tell their stories, all of those things are evolving into positive ways. Mm -hmm. And that museums can and are leaders in helping people to see agency mm -hmm. because they're doing it, you know, in a little maker space with their hands, or mm -hmm. they're having an experience of a new idea 
with someone else beside them and they can talk about this idea. Mm -hmm. And what I would love to see is more modeling of what future jobs could be. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see a little bit of that. Uh, and uh, I think the intersectionality of science and art is starting to pop up in museums. I think that future skills and future preparation are starting mm -hmm. to show up in museums. Like, mm -hmm. let's have a Yeah, certainly people are thinking about it more so than ever before, which is really interesting. And I do like the fact that you know, museums are are making a think about these questions, you know, I, I take my daughter, I have a two year old daughter, and I take her to all the museums here in Boston. And there's always something that makes them I mean, she's it probably goes over her head, but makes them think about like the applications of what they're learning, which I thought was, was really cool. Uh, so I, I agree, like the the whole way that we experience information whether it's through a museum or whether it's through the internet or whatever like it's 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 totally changing and and i honestly i think for the better like some of the things that you highlighted and the fact that like social media was like just so performative right it's like you show a picture just to show how awesome you are and like it's 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 shown negative effects i think that there is now getting pushed back against that i think that a lot of people see that and more people are interacting with things to just because of intellectual curiosity i think that's something that i see more often in like the younger generation that that i interact with like they're not on as social media as much as if you would think when they are posting it's not like you know take a picture of like my infinity pool in bali or something like that it's something more along the lines of like just like their friends or something but yeah, I, I I see those trends happening and I'm optimistic about the future. I'm sure that you are probably too. We are getting close to the end of our time. So I want to ask the three general questions that I ask all my guests just because I'm always interested to hear their thoughts. The first one is where do you get your inspiration from? I, I kind of hinted at mine, which is science fiction. Like I want to live in this utopian vision. And even what I'm doing, like I'm always thinking about how can I make this thing better? What about Maggie? What do you think? What are you thinking about? I get really geeky and I think about systems. <laughs> I'm fascinated with determination and mm -hmm. destruction mm -hmm. in the same system. And I, I think it's really quirky about how we used to think about the future and idealize it in, you know, 60s and 50s and, you know, the robots and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm sure your robot's going to be absolutely awesome. <laughs> I can't wait. Honestly, I tell every guest my the first day they have a robot that does your laundry. Oh my god, I'm going to be first in line with a down payment for that. You know. <laughs> anyway, I think that's going to be awesome. But so yeah, I think systems and and again in the robot example, you know the you, you set a down payment on the robot, like you know in a in a faster loop than we think that robot will be cheaper and more accessible mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. other people. So I get very excited about change, how things change and yeah. what the impacts are. So I'm yeah. constantly reading about that and, and theories and, and examples. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm optimistic about the future. Cause I, I think things will change for the worst, but they will also change for the better. Yeah. At the same time. Yeah. I always think about that quote from Martin Luther King, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. Like, I think mm -hmm. that the arc of history is long, but it does bend towards benefit for human beings. Like, I think overall, which, you know, it's very easy to look at the data and say that we're becoming less violent, you know, where more people have access to nutrition, more people have access to the internet, like all of those things that we hope that are happening are happening. And it's so easy to think that the generation before us was was so much better than the generation in front of us now. But I, I personally don't think that I think that every generation felt like that. And we continue on this like slow upward crawl towards progress. So second question, you know, we talked a little bit about systems and strategy where do you see that in 10 years? Like, do you think that that's going to be completely offloaded to artificial intelligence? Do you think that, you know, this is something that is exclusively going to be in the realm of 
humans because we're not going to feel comfortable with artificial intelligence making these kind of decisions how do you feel like it's going to look like in 10 years like the real like cognitive stuff what is that going to look like i'm not so so optimistic about that i yeah i don't want to end on a downer that's okay we got one more question we're gonna knock that (laughs) one out of the park you can you can have you have two out of three positive responses So I'll I'll give this one what I hope, which is going to be different than what I think is going to happen. Right now, AGI, artificial general intelligence, yeah, not so much on the radar. And that's coming a lot faster than AI, which is cobbling together ideas and data that have already happened. It doesn't have a very sophisticated runway to it. Mm Whereas artificial general intelligence isn't something that governments are keeping an eye on and Mm -hmm. thinking about how might computers start learning from other computers and then actually change the way our rights are. Hmm. So let me, you know, how do I spin that optimistically? Yeah, Um, I can, I can spin it optimistically because I respectfully disagree. And I I think that, so here's the way that I see it, just so that people can think about an alternative thing. I think artificial, I, I totally agree with you with artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence. The way that I think that it's going to play out personally is, and, and honestly, I was, maybe I, I was looking for a little bit of copium asking you the question so that I could get the answer that I wanted. But the, the, the way that I think that it's going to happen is that human beings will be uncomfortable with human with without human beings making the decisions i think that artificial intelligence even artificial general intelligence will be kind of like an advisor you know like uh for example right now they have in radiology the ability for artificial intelligence to point out different pathologies from x-rays from ct scans from mris that kind of stuff but it can't make the actual diagnosis. It can't make the actual decision, even though realistically it, it, it can sometimes outperform human operators, right? But the doctor has to be in charge of like actually making the decision to render treatment. And I think that's going to happen with governments. Like they're going to have artificial intelligence that shows them five different possible scenarios about building a bridge. And the contractor is going to say, this is the way that we're going to do it, you know? So I, I personally think it's going to be kind of what you talked about, like a cobot, but realistically in the hierarchy, the the human being is going to be in charge. So that's, that's my optimistic spin on it, but. Um, I, yeah, I'm totally with you. It's yeah. when it comes to people believing people having the final say, I agree. I think that that won't change. Cool. That's an optimistic version yeah. of that. Yeah. So we'll stick with that. So number three is something that I always ask my guests, like you're in this futurism space. And most of the times when I have people on, they're very focused on one cutting edge technology. So I don't know if there's any particular other technology that you're looking at that is really exciting to you. Like for example, what I, what I mean by that is I will talk to somebody that's working on nuclear fusion. I'm like, okay, outside of nuclear fusion, Excluding nuclear fusion, what is the technology, the cutting edge technology that really excites you that like you're reading in the paper, you can't get enough of, right? Some people talk about longevity. Some people talk about, you know, genetic advancements, but you're kind of like this, like catch all umbrella, right? Like you're, you're, you're a futurist. So you're looking at all this stuff, but I guess outside of like futurism specific, or maybe even outside of the things that we've already talked about, what is like a technology that you're looking at in the paper and you just like, you can't get enough of? You know, like you're so excited to see it come to fruition. Brain science. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I didn't think about that. Tell me a little bit more about that. The brain is such a black box and yeah. I'm always fascinated with how people are learning, how the brain works from a biological and mechanical spe- perspective, yeah. Yeah. but also people are weird and yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. make, they do weird things. And, and yeah, we still don't understand it the way that we would like, you know, like we think we do, but we really don't. I don't think people are algorithms. And so I'm fascinated with the question of how, how might we understand what people are 
thinking and doing and what motivates them and what demotivates them and what are they afraid of? And I'm really fascinated in how people are measuring that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's totally different. And I look forward to those results too. You know, the idea of, you know, brain science, I feel like is, it, I mean, you could talk about Neuralink and how like our connection between technology and the brain is going to play out or just even our understanding of where where we're at there's so much to learn and so so much progress honestly that's being made right now so i i never thought about that but yeah i might check out a few brain articles myself after having this conversation and thank you so much for having this conversation we're getting to the end of our time right now so i did want to just make sure that we thank you for coming on and thank you to all of our listeners who tune in on a regular basis as always if you could like and subscribe it really helps us and for those of you guys who are listening regularly, I will see you in the future. Have a great day, everybody. Bye. Thank you. We appreciate you taking part in today's episode. Take this chance to reimagine a better future by joining a community of futurists who strive for a remarkable world. Be a part of this growing network and contribute to making the world a more positive place. Visit thefuturistsociety.net and subscribe to the show so you don't miss a drop of hopeful futurism.